Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is, is Jim Manico. I'm from Hawaii. I'm a, a teacher. I'm an educator when it comes to secure software. So we're going to talk about software development life cycles. This is my favorite way when I give a talk to put a team of developers to sleep. How many of you are very interested in hearing about process improvement? I'm going to try to make this useful to you. I know this is a, a, a somewhat of a boring topic, but I dare say it is a very important topic. Those of you who are software developers, you spend your entire working life inside of the software development life cycle. I want to help provide ideas and suggestions to make the work that you do as a team more powerful when it comes to security. Let's get started here, right? No matter what kind of software life cycle you're doing, whether it's agile, DevOps, waterfall, or something else, there's some kind of analysis phase for the business. There's some kind of technical design that you're going to make. This might be a month-long process. This might be a one-minute conversation, depending on your team. There's going to be some kind of coding. That's the fun part. Let's code, right? There's going to be some kind of testing, I hope right? You're doing testing, right? We're doing testing, we hope. Some of you just push it live and let your users test, but we still do testing. And then there's some kind of operational phase where we have monitoring and other issues. So regardless of what your life cycle is, we have to address these phases. Zane Lackey, in one of his earlier talks, he talked about the operational phase. I'm not going to talk about that as much. I'm going to focus more on the technical design and implementation parts of these phases and the testing phase. So we'll talk about, again, design, implementation, and testing when it comes to building secure software. So here's what most developers think of a software development lifecycle. Let me read this to you. Name and describe the five key phases of software development. Denial, bargaining, anger, depression, and acceptance, right? We want to, yeah, this is meant as a joke, right? But this is what many developers really think of process. Leave me alone, I just want to code. But what we're doing is a team sport. If you're just writing code, that makes you a coder. And I don't think that's very valuable compared to being an engineer. If you're part of a team, part of a good process, part of an, an, uh, a whole orchestra working together, now you're an engineer. And I hope that you don't just want to be a coder. Anyone can be a coder. To really have a mature career and make a difference when it comes to security, we must be engineers. So that's what we're going to talk about. First of all, let's, this is a, an excellent guide from the, the automotive Linux group. And I just thought it was very impressive the way they said these things. Let's talk about it. Number one, security is going to be invasive. If you're a developer today and you're not addressing security rigorously in how you write code, when security shows up in your world, it's going to disturb you. It's going to be invasive to your day. It's going to be invasive to every line of code you write. And that's just the unfortunate truth. Security is either here or it's coming into your world, developers, and it's going to, it's going to involve big changes. Human beings are often resistant to change. So I challenge you as engineers to embrace this change. It's going to make you a better engineer. Number two, we can't just patch our software at the end of a project and get good security. We need something built in from day one. Gary McGraw, one of the forefathers of our, of our industry, application security, he talks about building security in, not just adding it as a feature at the end, but making it an integral part of the software that we're building. Also, we want to get secure software written right the first time, again, from the ground up as part of our core features, not let's address it later, but let's talk about it from day one, from the early phases of the software development life cycle. Also, you know, um, we, we don't underestimate the resistance of developers. Developers don't want to write secure code as much as they want to just get their work done from a functionality point of view. That's how we get rewarded as developers mostly, not from writing secure software, but from getting it working. It's tough enough to get it just to work. Also, then I'll, I'll skip down to the bottom here. And this is most important to me. It is fundamental that we have the right expert and management support from the beginning. 
You know, without having a good expert in application security helping lead these efforts, it's very rare where a company is able to consistently build secure software. So I think this is an excellent resource, again, from the Automotive Linux Group. They, they wrote these principles down pretty well, I dare say. Let me tell you a story. Anybody know which rock and roll band we're looking at up on screen here? Anybody? Anybody old like me? This is Van Halen! Van Halen, yeah, go ahead, jump. So there's an important story about Van Halen I want to share with you. Van Halen uh, was an early rock and roll band that used pyrotechnics and had a giant stage of about 15 to 20 different full-size trucks full of equipment. And this was very different in the music industry in an era where most music bands had three trucks at the most and had a minimal stage. Van Halen showed up in the 80s and changed it with dancers and and fireworks and a, an elaborate stage setup that made the show bigger than any rock and roll band of their era. In their contract, they said, if there is one brown M&M in the M&M's, a candy, in our dressing room, then you must pay us in full and the show is canceled. Here's the exact contract. Warning, no brown M&M's. Now, they didn't do this to be crazy. They did this for safety because they had so much dangerous equipment. They had so much pyrotechnics and heavy equipment that, that unless you read the contract carefully and followed all the safety regulations, then the band's lives were in danger. So this was not just to be a crazy rock and roll band. These brown M&M contracts were about providing safety and security to the band. And so when I look at your software development life cycle, if I don't see a published software development life cycle document, even something brief, that's my brown M&M, that there's likely no, a lack of safety or a lack of security in how that software should be built. This is a boring topic, I know, and this is, yeah, I'm telling you, write down your SDLC, but this is the brown M&M. This is a, a good indicator if you're likely to be part of a team building secure software. So step one, publish it. This is my vision of what a secure SDLC should look like. And there's a lot of detail here. Let me cover just a few things. I'm gonna turn back and face this, please forgive me, but we're gonna start with requirements. We're gonna talk about requirements. We're, we talked about publishing your SDLC. We're gonna talk about some elements around DevOps and doing code preparation. We're gonna code, don't worry developers, we're gonna code, but I dare say we must go through a technical preparatory phase before we start coding. We'll also address some elements of testing that are very unique to modern development when it comes to security. So let's talk about DevOps. Again, Zane Lackey earlier talked about this, de this topic in great detail. I just wanna sum up a couple points. That in the past, when I used to deploy software for big companies, uh, back when I was a younger man writing a lot of code, whenever we wouldn't wanted to push software live, we did a lot of it manually. Where there was a, a, lot of, a lot of individual steps that we would write down and we would execute in order to push code live. And it was a very fragile process. It, only a few people in the company knew how to do it well. There were literally hundreds of manual steps to get complex software pushed live. Does that sound familiar to any of you? I know many of us still deploy software in those complex ways. In fact, one team I worked for, a big company, our, our deployment process was so complex and so fragile that whoever was doing the live push, they, we put a rubber chicken on their desk for good luck. It was the, the good luck chicken. And then all those other developers who were part of the lead team, we would get around his desk and do the tree dance. The, you know, we would do the... The, the tree dance, that's for my wife, the, the tree dance around his desk symbolizing the creation of something new in hopes that we would help the software be deployed successfully. This never worked. This is fragile. This caused lots of headaches and it wasted 
time, money, and goodwill amongst our customers. The DevOps movement is simple. It's just about automating everything that you can from building your software, testing your software, deploying software, and monitoring software. These are things that should be scripted, automated as part of your SDLC. And this is not even an advanced topic. It's basic. A lot of people put a lot of, a lot of beef into DevOps. I think it's a simple thing to automate. And, and a lot of developers tell me, but I don't want to have to write that extra code. I'm like, wait a second. You don't want to write scripts to automate the building of your software, and you'd rather do it manually with the rubber chicken and the tree dance. So I don't think it's, a, it's much of a debate. Automate your SDLC as much as you can. The benefits are obvious and dramatic, and we'll talk about it in our next eight minutes together. Here's like, if you're into DevOps or interested in DevOps, these are the two Bibles of the DevOps world. The Phoenix Project, I think, is the first book that, that very, in a very uh, exciting way describes the benefits of DevOps. And the Cloud System Administration is a more practical, technical book. They're very complimentary. I recommend you read them. So let's talk about requirements in your SDLC. What do you consider to be secure software. What do you consider secure software to be? I know you're all French, but please, I do not want a philosophical answer. This is science. So uh, from, from a scientific point of view, what is secure software? And very often when I ask this question, I get answers like, well, uh, users should only be able to use the software as I intended. They should only be able to access certain data. That's the answer of a philosopher. I want the answer from a scientist. And the answer is a clear list of functional and non-functional requirements that clearly describes to a developer what security property should be in your software. So in my world, I simply reduce security from this big, complex, difficult topic to just a simple list of requirements. Or actually, a complex list of requirements. The list is simple, the, the requirements are complex, but it, it helps us all be on the same page around what secure software really is. And I don't think you should build this list yourself from scratch. There's a good standard out there called the OWASP Application Security Verification Standard. This is primarily for web and web service developers. There's also the Mobile Application Security Verification Standard, which is meant for mobile developers, of course. This is a list of about 200 requirements in three different tiers of severity that clearly, specifically give you requirements for what security property should belong in your, in your software. And especially now, when application security is very new to many of us, we need these requirements to help us all be on the same page. So our testers, developers, and management all agree on what secure software should look like. This is a, a and again, we're going to help, this will help testers know what to test for, and it will help developers know what to build. And very often, these requirements are very basic. They lead developers to ask more questions about what that means, which is good. Here's an example of those requirements. They're broken into three different categories. The first category is for your most basic requirements for security for every single piece of software. The medium requirements are for very high risk software, finance. The third category is for government, military, the most secure software that needs to be built. And the key is don't use the list as is. One of the most important aspects to security requirements is to tailor them specifically to your team. Tailor the access control rules. Tailor which requirements matter to you and maybe some don't matter to you. So go through a tailoring phase and in a very short amount of time, you can go from the application security verification standard to a couple hour tailoring phase to now having a list of requirements specific for your software, your team, and your company that should drive all of your efforts, drive your testing, drive your development, and all other key aspects to the SDLC. Now we have a clear definition of what secure software should be for our company. This will help facilitate a lot of other positive activities. And the problem that I see in our industry is 
in all the different teams of developers that I work with, almost none of those developers get a clear list of security requirements. This is a massive failure of our industry and the software development life cycle. And it's a simple idea. Most companies, they really want secure software and it's just an idea. Hey, developers, go write secure software. But how do I do that? Well, I don't know, just you know, go figure it out. That doesn't work. That leads to insecurity. So this is, what the, this is a simple idea, a very high level management idea that is incredibly important to building secure software, right? I'm gonna skip this slide, that's okay, we can skip a slide. So let's code, right? Before we write code, one of the most important things we should do is have our technical security assets in place. So let me mention one thing, secure coding libraries and security services and being aware of the framework we're using and how to use it in a secure fashion through configuration, third-party libraries and other manipulations of our framework. <coughs> Many developers are just thrown into a framework, go use Spring and go, and they figure out over time how to use it securely, which is a bad idea. So those of you who are architects, if you're an architect and you sit in an office and build documentation and you know, don't really get involved with developers and don't do any coding, then you should leave. You're, you're useless. You're useless. If you're an architect who is involved with your developers, working with them day in and day out, helping build secure coding libraries, helping establish standards, then you are useful. But there's a lot of uh, bureaucratic architects who hide away in their tower and don't work with developers. And I really discourage that behavior. We want to get involved. We want to help build secure coding libraries, frameworks, and components that the rest of our team can use to write secure software. This is the most important aspect of application security, right? This is reusable security controls. These are the core building blocks to secure software. And yet, as an industry, we put almost no focus on this. This is an afterthought, because I can't really sell this in a pretty package. I can't sell this to you as a service. This is something that you as developers must build and maintain and leverage through your software development life cycle with security involved. So if, if you're asking, how do I get started with application security? What's my first step? I think this is it. Requirements? that drive what security is, and then secure coding libraries, framework components, and other core components that other developers in your team can use to provide secure software. This is the building block for all of application security. And again, very few put focus in on this. And that's, I think that's a problem. I think this is also a great place to get started when you're addressing security for the first time. I, one of my flaws, one of my character flaws as a person is I really love the sound of my own voice. I'm, I'm a talker. So in my 18 minutes, I covered maybe half of my presentation because I'm a big talker. So a few things, checklists are good. Big secure coding books are bad. I know this, I wrote one, didn't help. So a checklist that, that drive your requirements is gonna be extremely helpful. When it comes to testing, the later you test, the more expensive it's gonna to be to fix a bug. The, the earlier you fix a bug, the cheaper it's gonna be for your organization. Every study in the world has shown that, right? So what else do we have here? And last thought, and I'll call it a day. Static code analysis is probably one of the most important tools for you to use when doing an SDLC. A secure coding analysis tool is a specialized compiler that looks at your code and it finds vulnerabilities. These tools are extremely expensive and they're not even that accurate, but they're necessary for secure software. There's two ways to deploy them. Once, you use it with an expert and turn all the rules on. Another way is to use them in a more DevOps fashion, use them in a more automated way and turn off most of the rules and just use a couple rules that are very high likelihood and high criticality. So again, I thank you very much for your time. Anything else important? Don't give raw scanner reports to developers. Make sure you triage your reports before you give it to developers and have a place for developers to go when they have questions about security. And 
wrist tracking. Yeah, wrist tracking, thread fixing. We're done. Thank you so much. <laughs>